Over the 4th of July, I asked you to hack into my server that I hosted at cybersec.fail. Now, I thought this would be kind of a fun challenge. I'd be interested in how many people would want to do it, who would actually just take the permission and scope offered in a tweet or LinkedIn post, and then just go on their merry way to try and beat up the server. How many people would do it, and then what would they do? So if you are one of those hackers who tried the task, maybe the first thing that you did was run Nmap, the network mapper utility on the command line, trying to get a little bit more intel and detail on what is the open attack server. Surface. What ports are open and accessible on that server? Maybe you ran the whois command, maybe you tried a little bit more detail on the domain, could have been anything. But if you did run Nmap, the first thing you would find is that TCP port 22, the port for SSH or Secure Shell, is open and accessible on the cybersec.fail domain. Now, Port 22, SSH, is command line access. Like, that's remote control of the machine. That is ideal in the hacker's world. But it is meant to be secure, right? You need a password, you need credentials, sometimes you might need a private key. In this case, password authentication is open, and I've left this server configured with weak credentials. So then you, as a hacker, might spin up Hydra or some brute force utilities, things that you can crack and, I don't know, throw passwords at the server to see what will let you authenticate. You need to know a set of usernames, like, oh, maybe some defaults, like Ubuntu, like root, like, hey, maybe just assuming me as the owner, John, could be a username. And then any passwords you might want to use, like rocku.txt or fasttrack.txt, any regular dictionary words would probably work just fine, and it's worth a try. And just like that, super duper easy, you probably uncovered my password, or the user John password, is set to I love you. And with that, you could log in, hey, get access to the server, it looks like the host name and the bash prompt is SRV04, and you could navigate around, you could try to do some privilege escalation, maybe add persistence if you wanted to, you could have your merry way in your cybercrime jolly jaunt and hacking extravaganza. Or maybe even easier, you found that the root password is actually easily brute forceable by one of the old usual like Kali Linux references for Tor, or T-O-O-R, the word root backwards. Even then, immediate access as the super user. You win, game over. Unless you did log in and maybe go explore, hey, turns out this could be a Docker container, you'd probably check that at the .docker file in the root of the file system. I don't know, maybe you still want to explore and see more. Anyway, Anyway, the core of this, the real experiment here, the real challenge, is that this was a trap. This was bait. This was a honeypot. I set up a server that is configured to monitor what you do, what threat actors, what hackers, what other cyber criminals might be trying to beat up on the ports, on the network, and then once they have initial access, once they're trying to interact with the file system over SSH, I can see all of the commands that they run. So I want to get into some of those cool fun facts. We can dig into the results, see all of the things that you ran, however many IP addresses started to beat up the server and what commands they tried to run, but I do want to tell you about how this is all put together. See, I'm using a utility called Cowrie. Cowrie is an SSH honeypot. It creates a fake file system and then monitors for every single thing that you do as you're operating and interacting with the server. I don't know if you noticed, but if you tried to log in and then write a file or make any changes to the file system, as soon as you log out and then log back in to validate those changes are still there, they're not. They're gone. It's completely temporary, ephemeral, and all just faked to make you feel like you're on the box. But with this, I could see what you do. I could see, hey, what are you trying to go after? Are you looking for passwords? Are you trying to find a privilege escalation vector? Are you dropping any leap zero days for some stupid reason? I, as a defender, get the upper hand because I have visibility into what you do. This, if I may, is a little bit of a tidbit from that idea of cyber deception, right? Active defense, active countermeasures, things that allow you, the defender, the blue teamers, the protectors, the folks trying to lock down and harden the this infrastructure and know the environment with visibility, telemetry, and everything. This gives you a little bit of an upper hand against the adversary because you can know what you're up against. And on that note, I gotta fill you in. This is actually one of the labs. This is one of the activities and exercises setting up Cowrie and this SSH honeypot with the anti-siphon training, the Black Hills information security, and all the great folks over at John Strand's tribe of companies for their pay what you can courses. And it's totally free if you want it to be, or if that's what's more accessible for you, you can just go Take a look at what they have to offer. You can sign up, hey, link in the description, everything that you might be interested in. Super appreciate them and their support for this video. But I was taking a look at that lab that's freely available on GitHub, by the way. You can just poke and play. But I thought, man, maybe it's a little bit small. It's a little bit short. I thought, let's make this a little bit more of an interactive and engaging way where I literally throw you against the honeypot and then don't tell you. 
Did you fall for it? I gotta ask, I wanna know. Did you fall for this? Did you think you were beating up a real box? Could you tell? Were there any indicators? Were there any identifying breadcrumbs or telltale signs or tidbits that filled you in? Hey, I'm inside of a honeypot right now. And could you tell that it was cowrie, specifically that SSH honeypot? Please, please, please let me know in the comments. I think that would just be super duper cool. Anyway, now let's see how this experiment went. Let's get into the data, let's get into the numbers, the metrics, the analytics, and let's see what commands you all ran and how many of you tried to beat this thing up. Okay, so let's dig into the data. I am inside of Sublime Text, just as a simple text editor to look through all the raw data because I tried to upload it to Google Docs, Google Drive, Google Sheets, but it's like a 300 megabyte all data file, like the CSV export, and it's just too much and it choked and it wouldn't work. So I try to cut this up on the command line. I've included the command that I used to dig up all of that data in the output, but let's start with the unique IP addresses that all tried to connect and work against this honeypot server. So this is a command that I ran. I was just working with the all data CSV file that I exported. I'm cutting it up on the limiters and then grepping four IP addresses because for some weird reason, I think I got like literal linpeas output in some of the calorie logs and I don't understand how that happened. But and then I go ahead and sort it on all and get the unique IP addresses. Now I have redacted these because I don't want to showcase your genuine legitimate IP addresses. I feel like that would be a little bit irresponsible. Uh, but obviously this isn't all that interesting because look, it's just IP IP addresses that are redacted, but the tidbit that I think would be worthwhile to take away from here is that there are about 2,000, 2,200, and I guess 16, if you subtract the beginning lines at the very top of this, about 2,000 unique IP addresses that came and beat up this machine. Now, if we take a look at the potential pool on Twitter, this had about, okay, maybe 90,000 views if we round up. Tweet analytics looks like about, yeah, that amount of impressions and that amount of potential opportunities for people to go get some inspiration from that. Over on LinkedIn, uh, there were about 70,000 impressions on that. Uh, and okay, those potential folks coming to beat this thing up. But I do have to note, okay, we only had about 2,000 or so actually get on keyboard and start to interact with the machine. Now, Let's take a look at another piece of interesting intel here, the count of the IP addresses. This 108 IP address was beating up the machine and trying to hey, interact with it over 156,000 times. Uh, <laughs> this is the number of times that an IP address has interacted with it, whether it's whatever a connection, whether it's some SSH key exchange, whether it's anything. You can see that there is a pretty big cliff from that 156,000 to 57,000, 38,000, and then that just seems to dwindle as I move down and further into other IP addresses and how many times they either tried to beat this thing up with Hydra, spam it with something, uh, or interact with it and run any sort of event that Kauri would log. About 150 a lot is a pretty constant, about 150. Bringing this down, obviously, hey, we get the absolute count of our uh, max number of IP addresses. That was 200 and, sorry, 2,216, maybe about two interactions. So crazy stuff. But let's dig into a little bit more here because all of these came with login attempts, right? SSH was gonna end up being uh, connected here. Now, here is a list of all of the login attempts. This is every single interaction where it tried a username and a password to connect over SSH. And this is kind of interesting because you can see everything that they tried. Not sure where they're getting a couple of these usernames for potential users. Uh, I feel like this was just, hey, throw in the kitchen sink and seeing what would stick. Kind of trying a pairing of the username and password being the same over and over and over again. And while we're look, scrolling down to like 50 or 60 in the entries here, let me bring this vertical scroll bar all the way down. You can see that there are about 255 thousand login attempts, rounding up a little bit here. But hey, cruising up to the last couple ones, it's still trying to beat up Root, and that's kind of wild. Of the 2,000 IP addresses that tried to beat this thing up, it made for 200,000, two and a half hundred thousand of login attempts, whether or not I would try username and password pairing. Now, let's see how many of those actually succeeded. If we move into the count of the login attempts, we can see that there are about 335 successful login attempts with the root Tor username password pairing. Only 335 attempts. So I don't know how many of you actually got on the box, 
as Root, but again, trying just as John, that had a successful pairing with John and the I love you password and 238 failed attempts for Root and Root as a username and password uh, combination here. Those are the only two users on the box, just Root and John, by the way. There is another little bit of a trap or trick because the Phil user that some of you might've seen, and I think if we actually get into all of the unique login attempts, is that where I was previously? Look, take it out, just random stuff in here between obviously spamming different attempts and a, a log4j syntax that is hysterical and awesome. Um, and I think that's fantastic. And that's the whole point of maybe doing this experiment. We can see what people were trying to spam and what they were doing. Random numbers to be the username or password. Obviously, a lot of those pairings. This is all interesting. And hey, I will be putting all of this on a public uh, Google Sheet so you can actually go take a look at all this data yourself. Again, I will be redacting the IP addresses. But if you just happen to type anything stupid or dumb in your actual commands, look, that's on you. Uh, I, I can't help you there. <laughs> we just got a boatload of data here and I thought it would be interesting to share. But take a look. That gives a total of 140,000 just about uh, unique login attempts where some people had uh, the same attempt over and over again. So that obviously differs down from our 256,000. These are all just the unique occurrences. Crazy stuff. But where was the uh, Phil? Did anyone try to beat up my, my man Phil? Okay, yeah. So Phil had 23 attempts with the 123456 password. Uh, Phil and Sweet. Okay, and here's a big long strain of folks trying to beat up Phil uh, because that was just a red herring where Cowrie would put the home folder for the Phil user there, but I don't think I had Phil actually created as a real user. I don't I don't think so, but I'd have to I'd have to double check and look in. Now let's get to the good stuff. Let's get to the super interesting stuff as to what commands you all actually ran on the box. Here are you on the keyboard as the operator trying to hack, beat some stuff up here. Uh, looks like, hey, now we start to see folks dig into fill, of course, ls, usually the first command that folks are trying to see what is here on the file system, a hysterical typo where we can see, whoops, our threat actor just fumbling on the keyboard, uh, typo for the echo command, and other things that folks tend to do, maybe looking for miners, if there are maybe just genuine, I don't know, crawlers or spams or mouse spam across the internet, trying to see, is there already a crypto miner here running? Because if not, they want to put in their crypto miner and do some of that damage. Of course, adding SSH keys, I think this is awesome. Awesome. Some folks kind of creating their own public key that they might be able to let log back into the machine with. Of course, that would fail. Uh, maybe some ping sweeps. Oh, probably potentially trying to see is this connected to anything else? Looks like some opportunity for lateral movement. Trying to dig into Phil's home directory, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this is just kind of cool to take a look at. Looks like it's trying to dig into, hey, what's the configuration of Nginx? Is there actually a service here? Some folks firing up Ngrok, that's pretty awesome. Checking out aptitude, checking out what text editors might be on the box seeing if there's my SQL installed. This could go on and on and on forever, but you see some of the usual interesting tradecraft of like, hey, trying to get like a, a full shell. A little bit of an interesting technique considering you are already in an SSH connection and that's a full TTY. I don't think that's necessary unless it's like a like boring, basic, vanilla, raw netcat reverse shell. But hey, trying to dig into Phil's home directory, checking out history, checking if SE Linux is on or enforced. Ooh, I like this one. Using wget to actually spin up uh, PwnKit. PwnKit that might've been hosted on ngrok. Sorry, I don't know about those IP addresses, my guy. <laughs> Again, if you do that on the box, like I can't stop you. Take a look, trying to W get down Carlos Pullup and Peas, the uh, Lin Peas or Linux privilege escalation awesome scripts, firing it up, trying to do some privilege escalation, even if they already had root or even if they just landed as the John user, that might be worthwhile to see, look, am I in a Docker container? Which you are, I will say. Hey, I spun up Cowrie inside of a Docker container. I don't think that would be present or visible though, because the dot Docker file is not included in the fake file system that Cowrie would create by default. Of course, you can mess with it, you can tinker with it and actually stage that there, but I didn't bother. <laughs> I really like folks maybe leaving behind some uh, flag.txt files. They run this with a touch command though, so that probably wouldn't actually output that. Uh, maybe, I don't know. Yeah, they created that file and, <laughs> yeah, they, and then they realized, whoops, hang on, I used touch earlier and that wouldn't actually output it into flag.txt file. So they removed it and then they put it in the real flag. <laughs> Hey, take a look. This is someone trying to use uh, dirty.txt. I'm going to assume that's dirty cow, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They go ahead and rename it to a .c extension and then try to compile it with GCC. Trying to do some of the dirty cow kernel exploits. That's pretty cool to see. A lot of these temp files for other Linux privilege escalation techniques, probably linpeas again here. Oh, this is nice. A little uname, dmessage, grep CPU. Hey, 
Echo, thanks for this fun experience, John. Love and respect, Zeno. Thanks, Zeno. You made it into the video. <laughs> Trying to change Root's password here? Kind of slick. Touch chicken nuggets, not text. <laughs> All right, obviously there are thousands and thousands of lines here, and I don't want to bore you with this more than I already have. Uh, again, I'll put this up and available so you can dig through it if you are interested, but it is kind of funny to see what are all these folks really typing and trying and doing over on the box here. Hey, John, big fan here. I hacked it, as you said. I appreciate that. Ooh, what is this? Boom shakalaka? Sorry, this is still just kind of like interesting to me. Look at a couple of folks be like, this is a honeypot. Yeah, honeypot, hey. Why did you give it internet access? Dude, how else are you gonna see it? what people do to it? <laughs> oh, 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 this has to be malware. Take a look, take a look. Beauty plus partner ML, M oh, oh, what is that? What is that? What is that? Great, thank you. Appreciate that. I guess I'll have to take a look at that later. There are a lot of these. Oh, look, those different domains. Yeah, okay. That's gotta be like some minor. That is the benefit, by the way, of, hey, spinning up this as a honeypot, as something that you can see what folks are doing, what threat actors and cyber criminals and actual adversaries might try to try against uh, your machines. So that's about uh, 5,000 almost commands actually ran on keyboard with an interactive session. If we take a note of that, though, you can see the unique commands ran. And obviously this has just, I don't know, maybe trimming the fat for things that people ran over and over again. The question is, what did they run? multiple times. And here's a couple, again, like broken output, probably from LinPs or something weird. But if I actually get into the count of the commands ran, you can see that there are about five and a half hundred actual inputs for LS, which is hysterical. About maybe 90 or so for the who am I command, other random things they might be trying, folks just bailing out with the exit command. Kind of cool to see, hey, what things did they ran multiple times? Lots of 12 occurrences for actually pulling down LinPs. Probably real genuine check for a minor, maybe nine hits for potential real malware. Interesting attempt to like actually stage a uh, SSH public key, but with like seven times over. <laughs> you can see comments here. That they might've just straight up copy and pasted from some guide online. I think that's pretty cool. Not gonna lie. I just think there's a lot of really sweet stuff in this. And it was a very, very cool uh, experiment. Now, in case you happen to be asking, how did I get this set up? I got to admit, look, it's super simple, pretty easy. It is just a digital ocean droplet uh, that I spun up in a separate location that I would kind of interact with, hey, from a distance, whatever proxy VPN shenanigans, I don't know, Tor if I needed to be. And then I would actually go ahead and just stage the Docker instance or the Docker container for Calorie, and then I would expose that on port 22. So SSH is open and accessible. I will be tearing this thing down like it was kind of fun to showcase it for this video, but I hope it gives you some ideas and maybe once it encourages and inspires you to create your own honeypot and see what threat actors, hackers, and cyber criminals are actually up to and what they might do if they're trying to go beat up your ox. With that said, this is all in the idea of cyber deception, active defense, active countermeasures, things that you might be able to do to waste the hacker's time so that you have more time to respond and react and remediate and do what you need to do and defend. So hey, please, please, please take a look at John Strands and Black Hills Information Security and Anti-Siphons Trainings and all of that incredible core tribe of companies and their pay what you can training. It can literally be accessible and affordable and whatever makes sense for you, you can choose the price tag. And the labs, the exercises, they're free. They're on GitHub, link in the video description. And please, their on-demand course for active defense and active countermeasures and cyber deception is always available and accessible. Go check it out, I hope you enjoy. Thank you so much for watching, I really hope you enjoy this video. This was a lot of fun to put together. And uh, I don't know, I hope it inspired you and at least got you interested in all this stuff out there and cyber deception. Thanks so much, all. I'll see you in the next video. Like, comment, subscribe. You know the drill.